In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Spirit, grant us in the same Spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's talk is on making a choice of a way of life. It follows the spiritual exercises number 169 to number 188. And this, the, the title of this talk, which St. Ignatius gives to these points, is making a choice of a way of life. So we might think that it only applies to those considering the religious life, or the priesthood, or marriage. And it does apply in those cases. But the rules behind these, making this type of choice, St. Ignatius wants to use for every choice in our life, so that every choice can be made in a right manner, without attachment, without inordinate attachments. And so the, the points which St. Ignatius gives are applicable to everyone who makes choices, whether they are big choices in life or smaller choices. St. Ignatius gives us these rules to help us make ordered choices in our life. In every good choice, insofar as it depends on us, our intention must be simple. I must consider only the end for which I am created, that is, for the praise of God our Lord and the salvation of my soul. Therefore, whatever I choose must help me to this end for which I have been created. I want to make a choice not sub, not to fit the end to the means, but rather to fit the means to the end. For example, many first choose marriage, which is a means, and secondarily, the service of God our Lord in marriage, though the service of God should really be considered the end. So also, Others choose the priesthood, and then secondly, to serve God as a priest. Such people do not go directly to God, but want God to conform wholly to their own inordinate attachments. Therefore, what they do is they make the end a means, and the means an end. What they see ought to seek first they end up seeking last, and what ought to be last, they end up seeking first. Therefore, following the conclusion of the first week, my first aim in life should be to seek to serve God, which is the end, and only after that, if it's profitable, to enter into the priesthood or to marry, for these are means to the service of God, which is the end. Nothing must move me to use such means or to deprive myself of them, except only the service and praise of God our Lord and the salvation of my soul. These are the dispositions that we need to make a choice. We have to keep in mind the principle and foundation from the very beginning of the spiritual exercises, that God created us to know, to reverence, and serve him. And this is because he loves us and he wants us to be happy. This is the foundation of discernment. On the other hand, we must also be open to God's will. It does us no good to say that we're discerning something when really 
the only thing we want is for God to do what we want. That's not discernment. We must be indifferent to what God wants of us, which means free from inordinate attachments. Otherwise, we cannot possibly make a choice well. We also have to put the means into place to be able to make good choices. And one of these is the spiritual exercises. As St. Ignatius says at the very beginning of the spiritual exercises, the spiritual exercises have as their purpose the conquest of self and the regulation of one's life in such a way that no decision is made under the influence of any inordinate attachment. Other useful means for helping us to make a choice are prayer, daily reception of Holy Communion, silence, reading the sacred scriptures, and spiritual direction. When we listen to God and do His will, we come to resemble what He wants us to be. In the lives of the saints, we see that holiness doesn't destroy their personalities. On the contrary, saints are fully themselves. Sinfulness tends to destroy our personalities, and sins tend to make all people the same leveling out the differences between them. It reduces men and women, sin reduces men and women to that thing which they desire. We can think of, for example, greedy people that we may know. Aren't they all sort of the same? Is there really that much difference between them? We can say that sin drains the color out of men and women and replaces it with the color of sin, which is a common property. All sinners look less like themselves and more like one another. On the other hand, saints are intensely themselves. God created us all as individuals, and all of us are something special. Since holiness means growing closer to God, the holier we are, the closer we are to the God who created us, and the closer we become to that perfect individual that he created us to be. This is what we want in order to be able to make good and correct choices in our lives. Let us consider now matters about which a choice should be made, starting from number 170 of the Spiritual Exercises. The purpose of this consideration is to ascertain information on the matters about which a choice should be made. The first point that St. Ignatius makes is that a choice should be about something which is either indifferent or good in itself. It is absolutely necessary that everything we wish to make a choice about is either indifferent or good in itself, and such that it's lawful within the precepts of the Church, and not bad or opposed to the teachings of the Church. So what we mean here is that there's no debate about whether I want or not to go to Mass on Sundays, or whether or not to commit murder. Those are not things which are indifferent or good in themselves. However, there are many things which are good. To get married, or to enter religious life, to enter seminary for the diocese or for a religious order, to keep working at my present job, or to cut back and take up some volunteer work. All of these are either good or indifferent in themselves. So the most important question then becomes, 
What does God want? The second point that we consider is that some choices are unchangeable while others are changeable. And this is number point number 171 of the spiritual exercises. There are some things that fall under an unchangeable choice. This includes the priesthood, marriage, and things like that. But there are others which we can change. For example, to receive temporal goods or to renounce temporal goods. To understand this better, we see that the distinction between changeable and unchangeable choices is important because some decisions I can go back and re-examine, whereas others, not so much. The third point we consider is that is number 172 of the spiritual exercises. For an unchangeable choice, one must be sorry if chosen without due order. So this would be unchangeable choices, such as choosing, marriage, or the priesthood, or the religious life. With regard to an unchangeable choice, once it has been made, for instance, by marriage or the priesthood, since it cannot be undone, no further choice is possible. If the choice should, is not made, or has not been made as it should have been, and with due order, that is, without inordinate attachments, that one should be sorry for this and take care to live as well as possible in the life that one has chosen. Since such a choice was inordinate, it does not seem to be a proper vocation from God. Some consider a divine call out of a perverse and wicked choice. But every true vocation that comes from God is always pure and undefiled, uninfluenced by the flesh or any inordinate attachment. And now let us consider changeable choices in point number 173. For a changeable choice, one must strive to perfect oneself in the choice. In matters that may be changed, if one has made a choice properly and with due order, without any yielding to the flesh or the world, there seems to be no reason why one should make it over. But let one perfect oneself as much as possible in the choice that one has made. And St. Ignatius gives then a note. It is to be observed that if a choice in matters that are subject to change has not been made sincerely and with due order, then if one desires to bring forth fruit that is worthwhile and most pleasing in the sight of God our Lord, it will be profitable to make a choice in the proper way. So this first set of rules that St. Ignatius gives are set the stage for the further points of how to make a choice. So we, we've seen the distinct, distinguishing between changeable choices and unchangeable choices. And we see that choices can only be made about good or indifferent things, and not things that are evil or bad. So the, the main part of this talk will be on how to make a good choice. And again, this can be about unchangeable choices, such as things like a vocation, but it can also be about changeable choices, things that are of smaller importance, that can be changed in life. St. Ignatius gives three rules for how to make correct decisions, how to make correct choices, beginning in point number 175. There are three times when a correct and good choice of a way of life may be made. 
The first time to make a correct and a good choice of a way of life is when God moves and attracts the will. When God moves and attracts the will. When God our Lord so moves and attracts the will that a devout soul, without hesitation, or the possibility of hesitation, follows what has been manifested to it. And here we see examples in St. Paul and St. Matthew in their following of Christ. For example, St. Paul and the conversion that he experienced, a sudden conversion, when God moved and attracted his will in such a way that he, that St. Paul changed how he acted toward Christians. And not only did he stop persecuting them, but he became an apostle of Christ. That God so moved and attracted his will. We also see this in St. Matthew. St. Matthew was a tax collector. And Christ our Lord called him, and he got up, he left everything, and he followed. That God so moved and attracted his will, that left, that he got up and left. He made the choice to change his life, and he too became an apostle of Christ. We also, we, we, for an explanation of this, we see that in this type of choice, when God moves and attracts the will, it's an interior call that God calls and I answer. There's no way that I can doubt that it's him who has called me to do something. And the key here is that something is shown or revealed to the individual that the will of the individual is invari invariably drawn to that choice, moves toward it, and there can be no doubt that it comes from God. In a way, we see this also in an individual way in so many calls to religious life, that it is a, a call to the interior, to the heart, to the soul of one, of a person. That God moves and attracts their will, that they cannot resist the divine calling to the consecrated life. The same is true also in many cases in calls to the priesthood and in calls to marriage. What is important here is that there's no need to wait and see if God does this again. He's not obligated to do so. That's it. He has shown the will and he's moved it. He doesn't ever have to repeat that ever again in one's life. He has shown that individual their vocation. The response of the person is still free. It's not that God imposes an obligation on a person or makes one follow. It's a free response. Yet, what is shown to the interior, to the heart of a person, gives such a peace, joy, confidence, direction, and a sense of being loved by God, that that impression remains on the soul for years after the initial inspiration, after this one movement of the soul. The same as we see in the lives of St. Matthew and St. Paul, that they had that experience one time and they followed it freely for the rest of their lives. Because this call is an individual call to the interior, it's really hard for us to get an account of how many times this may happen. But I think 
we can say that this is the, the most uncommon of the ways of making a choice. Oftentimes, God allows us to struggle so that we can really make the decision ours. St. John Bosco writes about this type of decision. I think it is a grave mistake to know if you have a vocation or not. The Lord puts us in such circumstances that we don't have to do anything more than go forward. Go forward. We only have to respond to him. A vocation is difficult to know when one does not want to follow it, when those first inspirations are rejected. It's there that the tangle gets confusing. Look, when a person is indecisive about whether or not to become a religious, I tell you openly that that person already heard their calling. They didn't follow it immediately, and now they find themselves confused and indecisive. And this confusion and indecision is a result of not responding to that initial call. When those initial graces were rejected. So this is the, this is the first way that one may make a choice in life that God so moves and attracts the will. Let us now consider the second way, the second time to make a, a correct and good choice of a way of life. And this is through consolations and desolations. St. Ignatius gives this point in number 176. If you have not yet watched the video, on the discernment, the rules for the discernment of spirits, stop this video and go watch the, the rules for the discernment of spirits, because without that knowledge, you won't be able to understand this type of choice. So, for the second point, through consolation and desolations, we are able to discern the will of God in our life and how to make correct choices. St. Ignatius says, when much light and understanding are derived through experiences of desolations and consolations and discernment of diverse spirits. What is consolation? It is spiritual joy, hope in things of above, tears, and every interior movement which leaves the soul consoled in our Lord. The, cons the contrary of consolation is desolation. It's a sadness, a lack of confidence, a lack of love, dryness in prayer, in going to Mass, and spiritual things. This is desolation when the soul feels dry. In this second mode of discernment, Discernment of spirits, so the discernment of consolations and desolations, and the discernment of God's will coincide. Through the discernment of consolations and desolations, a person attains sufficient clarity and understanding for the discernment of God's will. Among the three modes of making a choice, St. Ignatius says, if God does not move a person in the first mode, one should dwell persistent, persistently on the second, that of recognizing one's vocation by the experience of, of consolations and desolations, in such a manner that as one continues with one's meditations on Christ our Lord, one finds that that one observes that when one finds oneself in consolation, that choice to which God moves that person, and likewise to discern what one what choice is moved, what choice one is moved to 
when in the time of desolation. And the way that this can help us to make a choice is that in consolation, the good spirit is the one that guides. Whereas in the desolation, it's the bad spirit or the evil spirit who guides and counsels. And this is how the, this mode of discernment emerges. Because when I review, or when you review, when one reviews their personal experiences of consolation and desolation, one should ask themselves the following. In times of spiritual consolation, to what option do I feel inclined? To one choice over another? Has this inclination repeated itself? Has it repeated enough, itself enough that I can see a pattern? Enough that since in consolation the good spirit guides and counsels us more, I may confidently judge with the help of my spiritual director that God is calling me to this option? Is this judgment further confirmed by the opposite desire during times of spiritual desolation? During spiritual desolation, the evil spirit guides and counsels more. So what we want to do in this second mode of discernment is to see what pattern emerges. For instance, if during time of consolation, I feel the desire to become a priest, and this fills me with joy. But when I'm in desolation, there's nothing I'd rather do less than become a priest. From this pattern of consolation and desolation, I find out that God probably wants me to be a priest. Of course, this is a simplification of a process that takes time and prayer. But this is the general way of this mode of discernment. So, in summary, what we're looking at in the second mode of discernment is to review those periods of consolation and desolation in our life. This is not sensible consolation and desolation, but spiritual. So we're looking at those spiritual movements of our soul. If we're in spiritual consolation, this is when we have joy, hope in things of heaven, tears, and every interior movement which brings us closer to God. In spiritual, des in spiritual desolation, this is a, an interior sadness, a lack of confidence, a lack of love, a dryness and aridity in all spiritual things. So we see these two types of movements in our soul. And we want to see how these types of movements correlate with my desire to make one choice or another. We remember that in times of consolation, spiritual consolation, that God is the one that guides, the good spirit guides, God, the guardian angels. And so if in this type, in this time, when we're in consolation, I'm inclined to one choice, to, to religious life, to the priesthood, then this is what God is inclining me to. And yet if I'm in spiritual desolation, dryness, aridity, sadness, a lack of confidence, and I'm drawn to the opposite, to leave religious life, to leave the priesthood, to leave marriage, then I want to observe that it's the evil spirit that's guiding during those times. It's not the good spirit. And so by examining and correlating these movements of my soul with the knowledge that in consolation the good spirit guides and in desolation the evil spirit guides, then I know what the correct choice is. And I can make this choice based on the movement or the, the counsels that, that I receive during those times of spiritual consolation and spiritual desolation. So in this second mode, we use 
the inspirations from the good spirits and the evil spirits to acknowledge what God's will is for us. And then we can make that choice based on that discernment of spirits. It requires us to, to know about ourselves, to know about those movements of the soul. It takes reflection and discernment. So we can see that it's very different than the first mode of, dis of making a choice. The first mode, it can be instantaneous, that God so moves the will and attracts it, that there can be no doubt about that decision of what God wants. And yet in this second mode, it's more difficult. Still certain, it can be certain to know what God wants, but it takes more discernment on our part. We have to reflect and see the movement of the spirits and how we are guided during those different times of spiritual consolation and spiritual desolation. Let us now move on to the third mode of making a correct and good choice of a way of life. And this mode is the use of reason, number 177. We want to be able to, to, do, to make a, a choice using reason. St. Ignatius gives us a precondition. It must be a time of tranquility. One considers first for what purpose man is born. That is, for the praise of God our Lord and for the salvation of one's soul. And with the desire to attain this end before one's mind, one chooses as a means to this end a kind of life or state within the bounds of the church that will be a help in the service of, of God and for the salvation of one's soul. That this must be made in a time of tranquility and with the end in view. It is a time of tranquility, that is, when the soul is not agitated by different spirits and has free and peaceful use of one's natural powers. What this means is that when there's no clear sign from God, so nothing pertaining to the first way, and there's no consolations or desolations to work with from the second way, then we come to the use of reason. Our reason, too, is a gift from God, and we need to use it well. So it must be a time of peace and tranquility. What do we do to make a choice using reason? We want to set before ourselves our principle and foundation. That needs to be the guiding principle of our lives. It needs to be a calm time. If we're bounding through consolations and desolations and our spirit is moving up and down between joy and sadness, that is not the right time for the third mode of discernment, the use of reason. So that's the precondition for the use of reason. It must be a peaceful and tranquil time in our soul. Using reason, St. Ignatius gives us two methods of making a choice, and starting in number 178. So we can say this is 3A. If a choice of a way of life has not been made in the first and second ways, so it should be made in those first if the conditions are present, then we come to the use of reason. St. Ignatius says, this is to place before my mind the object with regard to which I wish to make a choice. For example, an office or anything else that may be the object of a choice subject to change. If we are trying to decide between multiple options, they must be good or at least indifferent in themselves. In number 179, St. Ignatius says, It is necessary to keep as my aim 
the end for which I am created, that is, the praise of God our Lord and the salvation of my soul. And besides this, I must be indifferent without any inordinate attachments, so that I am not more inclined or disposed to accept the object in question than to relinquish it, nor to give it up than to accept it. I should be like a balance at equilibrium, without leaning to either side, that I might be ready to follow whatever I perceive is more for the glory and praise of God our Lord and for the salvation of my soul. St. Ignatius says that when he made decisions in this way using reason, he would first empty himself of any passion or attachment which often confuses and obscures the judgment so that it cannot discover as easily the radiance and light of the truth. And he placed himself without any fixed inclination or predetermined direction, like a matter, like matter which is ready to take any form. And he placed himself in this way before the hand, or in the hands of God that he was like clay, ready to be molded in the way that God wanted him to be, not attached to one or the other. And in number 180, St. Ignatius says, I should beg God our Lord to deign to move my will and to bring to my mind what I ought to do in this manner that would be more for his praise and glory then I should use the understanding to weigh the matter with care and fidelity and make my choice in conformity with what would be more pleasing to his most holy will. So what he, St. Ignatius says is that we need to ask of God to have a mind that sees things clearly and not influenced by passions or attachments and to have a will that will choose faithfully and courageously. We need to ask God for this grace. So these steps up until now are preparations for the use of reason. We don't jump right into the use of reason, but we want to make sure that we're prepared to make a correct choice using reason. And then in number 181, St. Ignatius says, to weigh the matter by reckoning the number of advantages and benefits that, if, that would accrue to me if I had pr the proposed office solely for the praise of God our Lord and the salvation of my soul. And on the other hand, I should weigh the disadvantages and dangers there might be in having it. And secondly, I will do the exact same with the second alternative, that is, to weigh the advantages and benefits, as well as the disadvantages and dangers of not having it. This means to make a chart of pros and cons. St. Ignatius came up with the pros and cons 500 years ago. It's not a modern invention. St. Ignatius says we need to write it out and see for each choice to make a list of pros and cons. Pros and cons for one choice, pros and cons for another choice. Write it out and see. Compare. As St. Ignatius' biographer writes, St. Ignatius considered with great attentiveness and weighed the reasons which presented themselves for one option and for the other, and the strengths of each and the weaknesses of each, and he com compared them among themselves. What we mean here are spiritual reasons. And sometimes after we've made the list, we see that some of the reasons that are on it are not actually that good. 
and that other reasons that we write down reflect something about us, an inordinate attachment perhaps, that we're attached to one or another. In point number 182, Sina Nisha says, after I have gone over and pondered in this way every aspect of the matter in question, I will consider which alternative appears to me to be more reasonable. Then I must come to a decision in the matter under deliberation because of weightier motives presented to my reason, and not because of any sensual inclination. So this is important to weigh the matter only by things of the reason and not by the senses or the emotions for this third way. Finally, in number 183, St. Ignatius says, after such a choice or decision, the one who has made it must turn with great diligence to prayer in the presence of God our Lord and offer him this choice, that the Divine Majesty may deign to accept and confirm it if it is for his greater service and praise. To place the matter before God so that he may confirm that choice. That this is the final step, to place the matter before God to see if he confirms that choice through the use of reason. Finally, Ignatius turned again to our Lord with what he had thought and what he had found, and recently placed it all before his divine gaze, beseeching God that God would give him light to choose what would be, what would be most pleasing to God. So what are we looking for in this third method? Devotion, great tranquility of soul, the absence of any opposed desire and a sense of completion in the process could be the first inclination of how God wishes to confirm the decision made by reason. So this is point, or the mode 3A of the spiritual exercises, the use of reason by considering the pros and the cons, the advantages or the disadvantages of each choice, and then weighing the measure, weighing them amongst themselves. We also remember that for this third choice, that there must be that there must be predispositions, that one's soul must be at peace, and that one man must not be, be guided in this choice by the first and second modes. And finally, that it must be confirmed by God in prayer. St. Ignatius gives a final method using the use of reason, beginning in number 184. I call this one 3B. If a choice of a way of life has not been made in the first and second ways, so again, the same preconditions as 3A for the use of reason. This again uses reason to make the choice. And St. Ignatius describes this, this second method using the use of reason. The love that moves and causes one to choose must descend from above, that is, from the love of God, so that before one chooses, one should perceive that the greater or less attachment for the object of one's choice is solely because of one's of love for his Creator and Lord. So, in an explanation for this, what St. Ignatius is saying is that we must have the same predispositions the same basic setting for discernment as existed in the first method for the use of reason, that one must be tranquil of soul, not led by consolations and desolations. And now St. Ignatius gives us the method for making 
this choice. In number 185, St. Ignatius says, I should represent to myself a man whom I have never seen or known, and whom I would like to practice all perfection. Then I should consider what I would tell him to do, and to choose for the greater glory of God our Lord, and the greater perfection of his soul. Whatever I tell him to do, I will do the same, and keep the rule I propose to others. This exercise of the imagination does two things. First, it helps us to view the situation more objectively. But St. Ignatius also knows that it's easier for us to give advice at times than to receive it. Therefore, oftentimes, by looking at things in this way, objectively, it really helps us to decide what we ourselves should do. So we look at, at this choice from the perspective of someone else. What would we advise them to do? And St. Ignatius goes further in number 186. St. Ignatius says, this is to consider what procedure and norm of action I would wish to have followed in making this present choice if I were at the moment of death. I will guide myself by this and make my decision entirely in conformity with it. It is to look to consider at the moment of my death, a short time or many years in the future, and I want to look back at this present moment, this very moment, and say, what would I have wished to have chosen? What would I wished to have said at this moment? And I will guide myself by that choice. Again, for this method, I'm deciding between not things that are good and evil, but rather things that are all good or indifferent. What decision would I have made, would I have liked to have made now, if I consider it from the moment of my death? And whatever decision that is, I will choose that at the present moment. The last consideration, number 187, is to let me, is to, St. Ignatius says, let me picture and consider myself as standing in the presence of my judge on the last day, and reflect what decision in the present matter I would then wish to have made. I will choose now the rule of life I would then wish to have observed, that on the day of judgment, I may be filled with happiness and joy. Again, this is very similar to the previous exercise. I consider at the moment of my judgment, looking back, what would I wish to have chosen at this very moment? Which choice shows a deeper, a more profound love of the one who first loved me. We recall that God loves us first, and at the moment of my judgment, what choice would I have wished to have made in this present moment? Lastly, St. Ignatius gives a note. Guided by the rules given above for my eternal salvation and peace, I will make my decision and will offer it to God our Lord as directed in the sixth point of the first way of making a choice of a way of life. Again, I must always put the final decision before the Lord. So once I have made that choice using the use of reason, this is for the, the use of reason, uh, the third method, I place it before God our Lord in prayer, in silence, 
in the depths of my heart so that I can see whether God confirms that choice that I make through the use of reason. Let us desire and seek nothing except the greater praise and glory of God our Lord as the aim of all we do in our life. For everyone must keep in mind that in all that concerns the spiritual life, the progress that one makes is going to be in proportion to one's surrender to their self-love and to the surrender of their inordinate attachments, to the surrender of one's own will and interests. This depends the progress, or on this depends the progress of the spiritual life. So as we, as we conclude this reflection on making a choice of a way of life, following numbers 169 to number 188 of the spiritual exercises, we want to remember one of the fundamental principles in life. And this is that every decision that we make, which is in accord with God's will, God will bless us with the most grace, the most peace going forward, that he will give us the most help in our life when we make choices in accord with his will. But whenever we make choices that aren't in accord with God's will, he never forgets us, he never abandons us, but he'll never give us the same amount of grace as he would if we follow his, his desires. He has a specific plan laid out for us for every moment of our life going forward. And as much as we conform ourselves to God's will, the more graces he will give us in order to carry out his will. But whenever, he choo whenever we choose something less than what God hopes for us, he will always give us less grace. He'll still give us grace. He never lo stops loving us and helping us. But it'll always be less grace. And we'll never be quite as happy as we could be if we follow his will perfectly. And so, no matter what type of choice we make, whether it is for the great things in life, our vocation, for instance, or in the small things, small choices we make on a daily or an hourly basis. We want to make choices in accord with God's will, without any self-love, without any inordinate attachments. And this is not only for us to reach our end, but also because in this way, God helps us to reach that end. By doing His will, he gives us the most grace in our lives. So briefly, let us recall those three methods of making a choice for a way of life. In the first method that St. Ignatius gives to us is through the movement and attraction of the will by God, that God so moves and attracts the will that one is inclined definitively to one choice over another. And one still has freedom to respond or not to that movement and attraction that God places in the will. The second mode of discernment, or the second mode of making a choice, is a discernment through patterns of consolations and desolations. Knowing that the good spirit guides in time of consolation, and that the evil spirit guides in times of desolation, that one is able to discern what God wants, what, one, what, what God's will is, using that pattern of discernment. That if one is led to one choice in consolation and to the opposite in desolation, then one can, one can observe and ascertain what God is moving that soul to. And in the absence of either of those first two modes of making a way of choice, so there's no movement or attraction of the will, and there's no pattern of 
consolation, and desolations, then the use of reason can be used. And the first of these is through pros and cons. Weigh the matter before God to find the advantages and disadvantages of every choice that one considers. And then finally, to confirm that choice before God. And secondly, the, the second uh, use of reason is to weigh the matter objectively. And here we have three questions to weigh the matter objectively, to help us give advice to ourselves rather than receive it. And here I consider three things. What would I wish another to do in my situation right now? What would I wish to have done at the moment of my death? What would I wish to have done at the moment of my judgment in the present moment? And considering these three situations, I view the matter objectively and I make my choice based on the advice that I would give to myself when viewed objectively. And then finally, I have to confirm this choice by bringing it before God in prayer so that he may confirm interiorly that choice that I have made through the use of reason. Lastly, we want to remember that God wants us to be happy. God wants us to be perfectly fulfilled, not only to help us to reach heaven, but also to be perfectly fulfilled in our life on earth, to have great peace of heart. And this happens when we make decisions in accordance with God's will. He truly wants us to be happy by doing His will. And it is in this way that He gives us the most grace in our life. That He supports us in the choices that He leads us to. We ask the grace to, every day, in the great things and small, to make our choices in accord with God's will. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.